Welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette and we're so glad you're with us to stay curious. We got a little light over here in the corner there. That's all right. We'll get rid of that because I want you all to think I'm on Mars here, Marty. Oh, well, we'll just deal with our stuff here as I'm looking at a vista on Mars from not perseverance, but curiosity, the Mars rover that's been working for 10 years on the red planet there. And I know that looks like Southwest Arizona or New Mexico, doesn't it, Marty? Yes. My cameraman, co-producer all this time, Marty Winkle. We've had a day today opening up the museum. Uh, we were sort of ready to get open here, but we had a lot of little things to clean up and, and we've been busy today and uh, shorthanded on some docents. So I've been uh, doing our Cape Canaveral gallery and all kinds of things, but I would love to do nothing more than talk to you all and stay curious today. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to talk about the Perseid meteor shower on backyard astronomy today on Stay Star Curious, but we got to talk about 10 years in this awesome scene behind me of Mars. All right. Not not in the Western uh, America or Australia. This is Mars. And what is very interesting that we're going to look at on uh, 10 years on Mars with an SUV sized rover. All right. Someone's got one of those SUVs. If you don't in their driveway next to you, that's the size of this rover. And we've got a second one, Perseverance, that's been on Mars for just a little over a year. So, uh, Marty, we've had a good week. We're gonna we're looking forward to having with us tomorrow uh, uh, um, Tim White uh, is, is going Terry White. Terry. Sorry, Terry White's going to talk about the payload bay. We will not have Hugh on Wednesday. We're going to push Hugh back one more week. He had something come up, but uh, we've got shuttles of August to talk about this this week. Uh, and a whole bunch of plans that the American Space Museum is making to make you stay curious. So, first of all, we've got a meteor shower going on, and I would be featuring that more than Mars, uh, except the fact that this meteor shower is going to occur during full moon. This is what we call the radiant of where these meteor showers occur. Imagine that you're driving on a summer road, and you go over a bridge and all of a sudden a lot of a lot, lot of mosquitoes or gnats or something hit your windshield as you go over a bridge where a little creek is flowing underneath it and uh, uh and they hit you well that's what a meteor stream is like the earth is going in its orbit through several uh, points well, actually several dozen points where there's a lot of debris left over from comets or um Mostly comets, but occasionally debris left over uh, from the leftovers of the beginning of the solar system that's orbiting the Earth. So we go through this debris on a regular basis, and that is what the Perseid meteor shower, the most reliable of all, happens in the second week of August. Its peak is Thursday night, Friday night, August 11th and 12th, but the full moon is going to be on the uh, August uh, 11th. And uh, I think that's called the rose moon, Marty, the full moon of of August. Uh, they all have Native American names, and uh, I did not research that before I come on today and forgot about that. But those of you that are in snow territory, when you're driving at night in a snowstorm, it looks like that snow is coming right at you. That is the radiant coming at you. Though the snow's coming straight down as you're plowing through it in your vehicle, it's creating a point where it all looks like it's emanating. That's the illusion with meteor showers. This radiant looks like it's coming out of the constellation Perseus which is below our horizon until about 2, 3 in the morning. That's where that's the best time to look at the meteors. Although with the full moon up all night, you're going to see bright meteors and not the faint ones. Still, it's worth to go out there and get you a little moonshine and see if you can watch for an hour and then uh, uh, maybe see a meteor or two. And remember, moonshine is the only kind of moonshine from the sky that you can't get too much of. That radiant would look like this over a time lapse. That is actually the moon and what we call an all-sky camera recording bright meteors during a 
Perseid meteor shower where the moon is those is that arc over here going up that way that's the uh, different uh, moon and these pictures are taken uh, probably over it looks like a three hour period there so uh, my friend Matt Harbison is an expert at photographing things of the sky and there's a beautiful collage that he's put together of the uh, uh, more than this is just not this is over an hour, a couple hour period, and he's superimposed different meteors. But you see how they're coming out of one general area, and that's called the radiant. And uh, that's why you have the uh, Geminid meteor shower in December. It comes out of the, uh, the constellation Gemini, and so on and so forth. So hope that you get out and catch a few meteors uh, during our full moon phase here. Couple things about our when you're looking at the full moon, everybody's going to look up and see it. Is outstretch your arm, take your little pinky, and you can always cover up the moon. It's a half a degree across. Okay, now half a degree across that means two full moons makes one degree. All right, and directly overhead is 90 degrees. That's right, you could stack 180 moons end to end to end if you wanted to, and then another 190 degrees on the other side another 180 moons so 360 moons would span horizon to horizon if stacked end to end that's incredible to think about 360 mark not just 36 no 360 that's how small the moon actually is in in in, in our sky at a 2000 mile globe 240,000 miles away and uh but it looks gigantic, Mark, when it's going to be rising this weekend over the, the mountains of Tennessee, over the oceans here on the Space Coast, over the building where you live, or the tree in your backyard. Once that moon comes up, you're like, wow, he's wrong. I couldn't take a basketball and cover it up. Oh, yeah, you can always cover the moon with your outstretched arm. Your little finger will cover it up just fine. Okay, so go out and, and try that when you're catching some moonshine tonight. And if you got a small telescope, take it outside, put the highest number eyepiece, that's low power, like a 25 mm per millimeter, that's its focal length in millimeters, uh, where the light focuses. So use the highest number, that's low power, and then work up to the other lenses, because uh, there might be too much magnification, and as you move the telescope, uh, it, it's not a good view or it's blurred because there's too much magnification through the Earth's atmosphere. Let me have a little rocket fuel here. Ah, oh, that hits the spot here on a Monday afternoon. So I'll bet Dave Stang is watching us today, Marty, and we're, we're pretty sure that Tom and, and uh, Mark Usiak will be watching us. We appreciate them. They'll be down here to cover the Artemis launch three weeks from today will be the launch, and I hold up four. Three weeks from today is the Artemis launch, Marty. Where are you going to watch it? Space View Park. Space View Park. I'll probably, oh, Marty's going to sell t-shirts. I'll, I'll be there to help you, Marty. It's an 8.30 a.m. Uh, launch, and people will be covered up at our Space View Park, just three blocks from our museum, uh, nine miles away from that launch pad 39B, and we can't wait for that rocket to go off. And it's going to be some big, busy traffic around here that weekend, Marty. So strap it on tight because we're going to be uh, enjoying uh, some space history here in three weeks. And if they don't get it off on August 29th, the next date is September 2nd. And then they got a run of the 3rd, 4th, and 5th, I think, to get it off. So okay. hotels are, are uh, full uh, getting filled up uh, as people from all over the world are coming to watch the first launch of what uh, I'm not of a, of a giant rocket for the first time. It's not really a Saturn V class rocket because Saturn V was all liquid fuel and Artemis SLS rockets got uh, two strapped on uh, uh, boosters. boosters on it <laughs> that I call pop bottle rockets is basically what they are. So. And that's providing a lot of that boost. So we're going to talk about Mars here in a minute in our sky. And Mars, oh, look at that vista of Mars. Look at that. That's how this world looks right now. 
it's cold there when you're looking at it you're not thinking 90 degrees in new mexico oh no it is like probably 30 below zero where this picture was taken because this is curiosity climbing up sharp mountain in in a, a, a crater called uh, gall and we're going to see a picture of that here in a little bit the crater that it landed in 10 years ago and then a year ago february nearly an identical spacecraft did the same thing it landed on mars um, by a sky crane that actually swooped over and lowered Mars to the surface on a rope, and then they cut the rope on there. Now, we've got some other vehicles on Mars, but I want to talk about Mars a minute because we're going to be talking a lot about it in November and December. Every other year, Mars comes close to the Earth, okay? So about every 26 months, Mars is in what we call opposition, opposite from the Earth, as close as it gets. Right now, Mars is about 200 million miles from Earth, but in December, it's going to be only 40 million miles away. And of course, it's going to make it brighter and redder in the sky than it is right now. And it's going to be so red, it's going to look like a ruby garnet in the sky. You can't help but see it. It's going to be the uh, uh, Jupiter and Venus will be a little bit brighter, but Mars will be certainly bright. And this fall, in fact, Saturn is visible at about 10 o'clock at night right now in the east, and it'll keep moving uh, westward. And then Jupiter's right behind it, rising about midnight. And then Mars rises about 1.32 in the morning. So this fall, Saturn, Jupiter, and Mars are going to be across your backyard sky just like that. And we will be talking a lot about that. So you can see the rings of Saturn, the moons of Jupiter, and the polar caps and features on the surface of Mars at our stargazes that we're going to have uh, at the American Space Museum, as well as places around the Space Coast this fall with my buddies at the Brevard Astronomical Society helping us out. So uh, that's why we can spend a little time on Mars today, because you're going to be talking a lot about it, though we're going to see it. In a telescope, you can imagine these worlds like this on there. So, 10 years on Mars. This is a neat little uh, graphic that uh, NASA put out. And it says at the bottom, uh, stay curious. Okay, there, Marty. Uh, on the bottom there, let me zoom that out. See over there in the left-hand corner? Stay curious. Thank you, Tim Gagnon, the patch guy for bringing that to my attention so we could share that with you on Facebook and stay curious. Ten years ago, this untested way of dropping a fairly heavy, it's, it's almost one ton, spacecraft on the surface of another world by lowering it from a sky crane. And literally a jet pack zoomed over the, the location, lowered it down, and they cut the rope and all the other connections that were with it in a guillotine situation, much like... Marty's uh, lunar module guillotine to separate the ascent from the descent stage. And uh, then the, the, it flew away and crashed the, the, the flying part. Marty, you know where they got that rope, the Jet Propulsion Lab, to lower Curiosity and Perseverance the same way? I think they bought it at your local Walmart, just your standard rope. It was good enough and, and passed all their, their, their tests on there. So quite an engineering achievement that we did twice. And uh, here is uh, good old Curiosity, all right, covered with uh, red reddish dust that blows in the wind, all right. Now, Mars has an atmosphere, but it's one-tenth the Earth's atmosphere, meaning at the surface, it'd be like being on Mount Everest not much atmosphere to breathe at all. And if it's 50 degrees, which it sometimes gets on Mars, and we say that, that's at the very surface at your feet. At the top of your head, if it's 50 degrees on the surface at the top of your head, it'll be below zero, I guarantee you, because the Mars atmosphere is not a thick blanket that, that retains heat. So that heat built up from the sun is in the rocks, and the, the low uh, atmosphere density makes uh, the heat evaporate quickly. Now, there are dust devils, Marty, like many tornadoes all over Mars that are caused. There's clouds on Mars. 
Uh, and it's a whole different phenomenon than on Earth because these clouds are are usually up high in the, the atmosphere and it's cold and they're caused by um, little particles like meteor dust that get frost around them from, from being so up close there, from being so high up and so cold in the atmosphere. So that was one of the things about uh, our earlier rovers that had solar panels on them was they were only guaranteed uh, particularly the Mars excursion rovers, the Spirit and Opportunity, were guaranteed to last 90 days because they knew the solar panels would get covered up with this fine Martian dust that's everywhere. The reddish color comes from the volcanoes that erupted on Mars two billion years ago. Now they're dormant, we think. And the innards of Mars was that it belched out was iron-based, and exposed to the atmosphere for millions of years, it turned to rust. So everything is coated with this rusty uh, 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 surface. And that's why these rovers were equipped with drills and scratch pads and wheels of, of, of steel uh, brushes and so on like that to scrape off that, that initial coating that came from the Martian volcanoes. And these Martian volcanoes, we'll talk about them as we talk about Mars over the next few months. But there's a whole hemisphere that's called the Tharsis Bulge, just like a big pimple on Mars, that has the most gigantic volcanoes in the solar system. Uh, Mons Olympus is uh, 17 miles high. It's, it's caldera is 17 miles from the base. So Marty, that means if that Martian volcano was in Atlanta, all right, which is about 600 miles away from us, we would see the tip of that volcano from Titusville, Florida, sticking up above the horizon. That's how tall it is. Incredible to think and incredible to understand why this happened. So that's why the rovers are there. And this one particularly had equipment on to look for signs of life, more specifically the amino acids for the building blocks of life. And guess what? It found them. All right. Without a doubt, we know everything was on Mars uh, within the last oh, 100 million years. Uh, and particularly about four bit. Uh, Mars is about four billion years old. So is the Earth. All right. So we know in its early history, three billion years ago, it had lakes and small oceans like the Earth. And now it hasn't, and it hasn't for uh, many billions of years, a couple billion years. That's why we're there to figure out why, because maybe we can find out something that would happen to Earth to create another Mars environment where nothing can live on the surface. Well, let's look at another fabulous picture as the Mars rover Curiosity goes through a little pass that's going through. Uh, and this this uh, like a pass in a Western movie, okay? And look at the rocks on the left, probably thrown out by those volcanoes a billion years ago or more. You look at the, the mountains in the background, and then, of course, the thick depth of the sand that the rover went through, all right, leaving its track marks behind. So what a cool picture of the rover going through a pass as after 10 years is starting to climb up Sharp Mountain. Well, how many other things are on the mo on, on Mars, Marty? Uh, well, we've got uh, uh, four spacecraft orbiting Mars right now, including the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. We've got an Indian satellite orbiting. We've got a Chinese satellite orbiting Mars. And we've got Mars uh, uh, Odyssey. Uh, uh, by NASA is orbiting Mars, and we have the European Space Agency's uh, uh, Mars Express. So there's five orbiters, but how many objects are on the surface working? Well, I said two of them, Perseverance and Curiosity. We're celebrating 10 years. Did you forget about the Chinese? All right, here's Percy. There's Perseverance. Looks like it's kind of in a similar place but it's in a, even a wetter area. Perseverance landed in like, imagine the uh, Mississippi River Delta at New Orleans with the Gulf of Mexico drained. 
that is the type of place where we landed perseverance and there it is and look at the striated rocks in the bottom okay the only way you can get rocks like that layered is by sediment in seas or oceans that's the only way we know on earth okay and we're pretty sure that that's the only way it can happen on any alien world and there's evidence of look how high that water got on that that uh, uh big uh, ridge across from perseverance there but marty you probably forgot about that we have china has a rover on mars okay taiwan Tengwan. there's its landing platform and this was the selfie that it took last year after it landed uh, about a couple weeks after per, uh, perseverance did Got the Chinese flag there. This actually sat down with its arm like a GoPro camera and then backed off for what I think is one of the greatest images in a long time and a long line of great images from Mars. A selfie by a robot. Here's the landing platform, Artist Conception. Couldn't find many pictures, Marty, from China showing the the route but there are plenty of pictures we're following it by the orbiting spacecraft the mars uh, reconnaissance orbiter for one there it is on top of its platform it landed uh, on top of a platform uh uh and uh and then it, it rolled off much like we did with uh sort of like what we did with the surveyor and uh i mean that surveyor uh, we did with uh, the two Mars excursion rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, though they were in big bags, like a medicine ball that landed. And then when the, it deflated, there was the platform that it drove off of. But we've got a third working vehicle on the surface of Mars, and this one is called InSight. And this is uh, landed by America, uh, NASA, uh, about four years ago. It is stationary, and what InSight is doing, it's about to die because its solar panels have gotten enough, are losing a lot of energy because of the Martian dust on it. And though for, for Spirit and Opportunity, the two rovers that were the size of a golf cart, they lasted longer than the 90 days. One lasted six years until it got caught in a rut and, and, and couldn't move anymore, and its power drained down. And the other one lasted almost 12 years uh, uh, opportunity uh, because dust devils, mini tornadoes would pass over or close enough to these spacecraft to blow off the dust. Now, Marty, I don't understand why they didn't have a, a tube with uh, air that could blow out. And I'll bet they could have made a compressor to take the air out of Mars to blow it off. But uh, they didn't. And that is why... Uh, InSight is going to die probably within the next uh, three or four months. And what it's been doing, um, let me go back to that a second. What it's been doing, there's InSight, and it has a drill that it would go down a heat flow experiment and put a probe down inside the surface of Mars about four feet deep, and they couldn't get it much deeper than that to hear uh get the sort of take the temperature of mars and then this other instrument at the bottom uh covered with wind and thermal shield the seis is more like a um there at the bottom left is like a uh, uh earthquake or moonquake detector all right and there you've got very complicated machinery here you've got your antennas to communicate with the earth but they're actually communicating with the orbiters that are relaying the instrument back to earth and it's got a couple cameras on it there but it has a little temperature and wind sensor on it and that reminds me that here's perseverance okay there's perseverance in the distance there seen from the mini helicopter ingenuity the first flying object on the moon now that's one of the differences is uh uh curiosity didn't have the little helicopter on it and that was special to perseverance also perseverance has some um microphones on it so we can hear the wind and actually the machinery of of the mars uh, perseverance as it's roving but there it is in the distance photographed by its its uh, little minicopter ingenuity that has just about run out of power 
and and uh, though it was supposed to do five missions, it's done over twenty five, and has become an important uh, scout to find places for engine for uh, perseverance to go. There's ingenuity. There's a picture that the Chinese rover took of its landing shell and uh, part of the uh, parachute that brought it down. And there over my head is the big gain antenna where it communicates with its orbiter. It's communicating with a new orbiter. We're not allowed to talk to that orbiter because it's the communist nation of China and they're not sharing it with us. But we need to get some new orbiters around Mars so that they can be the communication satellites to beam back to Earth. Well, I wanted to show you in perspective what uh, Curiosity and Perseverance look like, like a, 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 a suburban uh, urban vehicle, SUV. And then the one to the left uh, with the panel, solar panels, that is what Opportunity and uh, Spirit looked like, like a golf cart. And then there's little Sojourner at the bottom there. And Sojourner was landed on our Pathfinder mission in 1996, the early days of the Internet. And when NASA started broadcasting pictures from this little rover about the size of a microwave, as you see among Jet Propulsion Lab technicians there, once they start beaming back pictures of that, it was the first crashing of a, of a website on the Internet as NASA's website completely melted as millions of people wanted to see the pictures and it couldn't handle the traffic back in uh, uh, almost 20, 20 years ago. Uh, so we started with a little sojourner there and then uh, to the left is, is the Mars Excursion Rovers Opportunity and uh, then there we have uh, opportunity and spirit were both of those and then we got perseverance and curiosity look much like uh, 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 to the right there now another thing perseverance is doing is it is actually drilling into the surface and it has little test tubes that it's putting choice selections into a test tube those little tiny rocks and whatever it grinds up and sealing it up and then dropping it on the, the Mars surface for a probe later to pick them up and bring them back to Earth so we can analyze Martian soil before humans go there. Yet, they don't have that probe built yet. It's still on the drawing boards. There's no money finance for it that I know of. Uh, if it has, then they're still building it. Uh, to go pick up these 20-some test tubes that will eventually be put together by uh, the uh, rover uh, that uh, has, has that capability there. Uh, Curiosity and uh, Perseverance is the one that has the, the capabilities of Perseverance. Curiosity doesn't have that. Uh, so this is what they added uh, uh, four or five years later. Now, every two years when Mars comes close to Earth, that's the launching window, all right? So you just can't launch something to Mars whenever you want to. You have to wait for it to get close to Earth so you have a, uh, a rocket that has enough power to get it there. And uh, so we wouldn't be launching anything to Mars until, well, this is a good window right now to be launching, but nobody has got anything ready to launch, all right? That's why we launched two years ago perseverance to mars and it's been there a year in february all right want to talk a little bit about the wheels all right you got to have some good wheels to go anywhere all right so uh, there you have the three uh, nasa rovers a little bit of perspective and the size of the tires and a little difference in the tire tread by the way the tire tread on the curiosity and perseverance they have raised grooves in those those uh, areas there in the tread of the, the uh, aluminum alloy wheels there. And they actually spell out Jet Propulsion Lab, or JPL. So those nerds in California, they figure out ways to always put their names on something. So it's actually imprinting on the surface of Mars, the, the initials JPL, in some kind of code. I don't know if it's Morse code or something like that it's not like you would read it and see jpl there so spirit and opportunity did not have trouble with the wheels the curiosity's having 
uh, or per, uh, per perseverance wheels were upgraded a little bit in that trouble we're talking about is in pieces of them coming out all right there you see a very cool shot of the undercarriage there's four or five uh, cameras uh, around the bottom and front and back of these rovers so they're they're guidance cameras navigation cameras and yet they can take real cool pictures too so i don't think the arm can get under there to take that picture but there you see pieces are missing out of the wheels from the heavy weight of the rover going over all of these rocks all right now this is a rocky dirty cold planet all right there's nothing warm about it all right though though they may say it's 40 or 50 degrees at the surface like i said that's at the surface and at six feet up would be below zero that's how thin the martian surface is so we're learning a lot about wheels that we need to have on crude vehicles once we go to mars for good so uh, that will be something to overcome again a little look at the wheels there uh uh, you got your outer rim, you got your spokes, uh, uh, your chevron features, they call them, the treads, and a, a, a stiffening ring and an inner ring on there. Marty, we've got a comment or question? Yeah, Ben Hurst was saying uh, it's Morse code, dots and dashes. Okay, thank you, Ben. I thought it was Morse code, but yeah, they've got dots and dashes to spell out. And they've also got... Uh, a mileage indicator there right there where my arm is that's kind of a, a, a wide gap so that they can look back and see this gap from the orbiter uh, and the wheel uh, tracks on, on the surface of Mars and uh, tell how many kilometers they've gone I believe uh, uh, I left my notes uh, in the, the printer Marty but uh, I believe uh, 28 miles is what uh, now is what uh, curiosity's gone in 10 years and here's where it landed right over here by my hand there there's where it landed in the blue and uh you can see they chose a crater that was filled with water and in the center of it is a mountain so they knew that they would see striated layers in this area and it's called gale crater and mount sharp is the crater uh, is the, the central peak and you see that the green is where it's headed up the flank and it's gone up about uh, a half a mile already it's spent almost nine years going to interesting sites at the bottom and around this mountain and now it's heading up to the mountain to show some beautiful vistas up there so uh, thanks dan Branick for watching dan i'll bet you're out taking a few shots of the moon uh he's an excellent astrophotographer there in uh, fort wayne indiana area Robert Law, thank you for watching in Dundee, Scotland. And then we got Gary Gerrell. Thank you, Gary. He was in the in our house today, Gary. And I posted a picture of him and his wife, Donna, and took a couple uh, pictures of Gary to help us promo Stay Curious. Um, so thank you for uh, all you, uh, for enjoying the show. And it's nice meeting you today, Gary. Uh, William uh, William's watching. Keith the Soul, Dave Stange. Uh, thank you, Ben Hughes, you said for uh, clearing me up there. Longia Sands and Martez Krasowski, thank you for staying curious on this star curious day with backyard astronomy. You're not going to see Mars like this from your backyard, but when you're looking at it this fall, you can envision that. Wow. Think of that. Look at that beautiful, beautiful landscape. In another vista of mars we're going to end our show here looking at a couple of these beautiful areas can you believe this is mars i mean it looks like uh, uh rawhide should be going through there and uh, well, over my shoulder here is a little uh yellow circle that's a big boulder uh about a house sized boulder that uh, uh curiosity uh, was around about six months ago and has traveled this much distance in there all right now the sky looks a little blue there but it should be actually more pinkish cast to it because of all the uh, but it's just washed out it's not really blue it's washed out so that you can get the detail 
In the, and the only way you can get this striated layer that we know on Earth is by having layer upon layer upon layer of silt, dirt, rock built up as uh, uh, in a ocean or sea. All right, so that's why we need humans to go to Mars and take the real samples. So if there was life on Mars, it'd be you would think that you'd find fossils with life on Mars, right, Marty? Of a bird or a, a Martian dinosaur, or, or all it takes is just one bone to to prove life was somewhere else. And uh, I pro I, I'm I'm beginning to believe Marty that we probably are pretty sure that life has been on Mars, and they just want to uh, actually see the single cells or whatever. Uh, but all of the ingredients have been there. All the amino acids are present. Uh, we're looking for the organic material that amino acids, when they combine in a magical way that creates plants, animals, and humans. Uh, that's what we're looking for now is the, is the biomass. But we're not going to find it on the surface because this thin atmosphere of Mars, the sun bakes it like a microwave oven 24-7. So it sterilizes the surface of Mars. And so nothing's going to be living on Mars, okay? Uh, but, we're, but it's a whole different story when you go under Mars. Because I believe there's a gigantic series of caves created by these huge volcanoes. Uh, and these caves, as we know on Earth, caves have a ambient temperature that stays the same, like around 70 degrees, very hospitable. And in a cave, you are protected from the harmful uh, radiation of the sun. Comment, Marty? Yeah, we, it's from Longia Sadie. Yeah. Uh huh, Longia. We're saying, I'm paraphrasing what she said, but she's asking, how long do you think before humans will go to Mars? Well, that is a big question. Personally, I think Elon Musk, if that starship works, he will load up a bunch of people within the next 10 years. And it'll be a suicide mission because they aren't coming back. Uh, and uh, got my Appalachia in there, okay? Uh, my Appalachia uh, twang there. They ain't coming back. So, but um, it could be, so, you know, I hope so. I think it would be, even if it's a one way trip and they know it's a suicide mission, the science and so forth is, is we will find humans that were worth making that sacrifice. And of course, they're going to be forever uh, famous, uh, like Neil Armstrong in the annuals of history. But uh, there's a lot to it. And, and uh, you know, a lot of people in the know will tell you there's 10 or 15 engineering problems we have to overcome. And the first one is this radiation on a nine month trip to Mars. And then you got to wait on Mars three months for it to line up so you can launch and, and have another nine month trip back and it not be uh, two years to get back. So uh, supplies for human food, water is going to be amazing how they're going to handle that on a nine month journey there and back. Uh, Buzz Aldrin, the Apollo 11 astronauts got all figured out. He calls it his Mars cycler that you have to start sending spacecraft to Mars unmanned that got all your supplies, that got the food, that got the, the uh, uh, machines that can make oxygen out of the Martian carbon dioxide based atmosphere. And we have done that on Perseverance. It's, the 10 year anniversary of Curiosity we're celebrating did not have a machine on it that could convert the Mars atmosphere into oxygen that we could breathe. Of course, we're breathing 70% uh, nitrogen in this room and 29% oxygen. People forget about the nitrogen in our atmosphere. So, uh, you know, I hope it's in my lifetime. Let me put it that way, Longia, because uh, uh, I, you know, I would love to see it and love to, to hear what Mars smells like. We, uh, not by them taking off their spacesuit helmet and smelling it. They'll bring it inside like they did the moon. And then they smell it in their lunar module. And what does moon smell like? It smells like a wet fireplace or gunpowder. There is some sort of a fire impact going on in that smell of the lunar dust. So 
Um, can you grow potatoes in it? Like uh, on the, uh, the famous movie? Uh, uh, I, we'll find out, I guess, on there. But I do hope I live long enough and that'd be another 10 or 15 years I think I got in me. So stay curious about that and thank you for asking. And here's our final parting shot. Look at that beauty there. You see the different layers. In fact, there's a, uh, I think there's a, uh, that is a uh, two kilometers, I think is what that, about one mile is what that is. So you see the, the, the layering of a crater impact and then another layering or is this the shore of a lake that lapped up the, the waves up to it and then in the background you see this gigantic mount sharp sticking up uh, where spirit uh, where uh curiosity landed 10 years ago another comment marty yeah i like it from uh it's in, give me a second yeah it's Oh, Larry Puskar. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, no sane person would go. I have to agree with that. Larry Pushkar says no sane person would go on a suicide mission, okay? Well, hi, Chris Callie. <laughs> would you go or not, buddy? Uh, you know, there's a lot of factors in that. One, uh, and, and one, um, the older you are, the more inclined you'd be to do it because if you've lived a good long life like Marty and I had, well, why not go out with a bang? Uh, or, uh, But, uh, you know, it's probably young people that are going to go and, and try to live there for a couple years, and it's going to be harsh. This is not, not uh, pr probably a lot harsher than the moon in many ways, and certainly you don't have a safety net of, of three days away from Earth to, to fall back on when we're on the moon. So, uh, but Larry Pushker, you might be right. Uh, uh, but uh, they called, uh, uh, they called um, Robert Goddard crazy, okay? And the New York Times made fun of him because they said, hey, a rocket exhaust won't work in the vacuum of space. You need air for a rocket to, to work with your, uh, your laws of physics and so forth like that. And boy, were they wrong. In fact, they they reprinted on uh, in 1969 on, after the Apollo 11 moon landing a uh, retraction of criticizing Robert Goddard by th not thinking rockets could work in the vacuum of space for one. So uh, so anyway, crazy it be, someone's gonna go, and and uh, like I said, I hope it's in my lifetime. So. Everybody, we appreciate you enjoying a little bit of Stay Curious today. Just want to shoot this up there real quick, Marty, to say if you get out uh, any time during the night uh, and spend an hour or so out uh, in the, the sky, uh, you might see a pretty bright meteor even with the moon out there, all right? And then, of course, you got the moon out there to look at and revel at and think about all those people that have walked on the moon, those people, 12 of them, all right? Just 12 men have walked on the moon. The last one, 50 years ago, coming this December, uh, uh, a half a century, kind of sad, sad to think that, that man didn't want to explore in the last five decades our closest celestial neighbor. Yet how freely does everyone want to talk about, let's go to Mars, everybody. Well, there's what we're looking forward to, seeing on Mars his postcard pictures like that. So... Marty, thank you for another good show today. Tomorrow, again, we've got Terry White, the manager of the Orbital Processing Facility Buildings, the garage of the shuttle. So we've got the shuttle garage with Terry tomorrow. So I'm Mark Marquette, and I hope you can join us tomorrow to bridge the space between us.